All right, hi everyone. I'm Jack, the Public Programs Officer at the Old Treasury Building. And welcome to our virtual lecture today on Frontier Melbourne with Dr. Rachel Stanfield. This lecture is in conjunction with our new and ongoing exhibition, Yarra, Stories of Melbourne's River, which explores some of the material in today's lecture. Today, Rachel will discuss histories of early encounters between colonizers and Kulin peoples in Nam, or what many of you will know as Melbourne. Drawing from one of the early colonists who spent the most time with Kulin peoples and who was highly prolific in his writings, the protector, William Thomas. Now, before I proceed any further, I'd like to acknowledge that the old treasury building is situated on the lands of the Kulin nations, specifically the country of the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung nation. And I'd like to also extend my acknowledgement to their neighbors within the Kulin Alliance, the Wadawurrung nation, whose country I'm speaking to you from today. I acknowledge their elders past and present. And today I'd like to emphasize elders past for many of these figures make up today's talk. As mentioned, previously, today's talk is given by Dr. Rachel Stanfield, who is a lecturer in the Indigenous Studies program at the University of Melbourne. I have the great pleasure to call Rachel a colleague of mine, and I've worked with Rachel over the last few years. And together we've done historical research for Indigenous communities, such as the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung community and elders. Rachel is a historian of Indigenous societies and colonial histories in Australia and New Zealand as well as the histories of racial thought and the ongoing impl implications of colonialism and racial thinking for contemporary societies. Rachel has also worked in public policy and supporting Indigenous activism for human rights. One of Rachel's areas of research uh, and interests is cross-cultural relations in early Melbourne during the Port Phillip Aboriginal Protectorate period, which is why I brought her here to you today. Now, without further ado, I will pass it over to Rachel to begin her lecture. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining here. Um, and uh, thanks for being here even in a lockdown. And even though I can't see you, I um, uh, Katie tells me there's people here. So uh, hopefully you don't get sick of listening to my voice when not seeing body language is a little bit hard in Zoom, but it's uh, great to be able to still uh, meet with people and have a chat. So before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I present today from uh, the unceded country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and that the museum also stands on their land um, and I work and live on their land as well. And I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Wurundjeri people have worked tirelessly since the onset of colonisation right till now to protect their country and support their families. And this is a struggle that I want to acknowledge here because it's something that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, I also would like to recognise that when we're in a Zoom environment, we can be part of the seminar from all over this continent and the islands offshore. So I pay my respects to elders from all of these lands. And I'd also like to recognise and acknowledge Indigenous people in the room. So like Jack said, I'm Rachel Stanfield. I'm a non-Indigenous woman, a white woman who's a historian and a lecturer within the Indigenous Studies program at the University of Melbourne. Um, and I've lived on Wurundjeri country for most of the last 15 years. I'm a historian who works in Indigenous studies and increasingly brings those Indigenous studies methodologies into my historical research. So this uh, research, as Jack mentioned, covers encounters and relationships between Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous people um, and the development of colonial thought and so-called ideas about so-called race in Australia and New Zealand, as well as these histories of protection um, and British humanitarianism that I'm going to be talking about today. So Jack has invited me to present on early colonial history of the place that we now know of as Melbourne. And I'll start by showing you an image that you can see. So um, 
a place that we now generally know of as Melbourne. Um, but recently, uh, uh, some people are becoming more comfortable returning to the original name of this area, Nurm or Nam. And this is um, an image here, a map, a beautiful map taken um, from the archive of material that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I'll talk more about what this archive is and who, who developed it in just a second. So today, today I'm going to be drawing on some of my research to think about the role of colonial conflict um, and the role of um, frontier conflict in this place. Um, Melbourne, a place which we don't usually perhaps think of as a frontier, but a place where Indigenous people were here as their home, just as all around the rest of the country, and a place then that uh, there would need to be dispossession of those Indigenous people from their land in order that uh, it could be uh, turned into a wholly colonial space. So the times that we're talking about today is actually where the uh, relationship of co colonial forces to this place is being developed in this early period of Melbourne. Um, and we have, um, we have this, uh, this sense that it's not that usual to think of an urban environment as a frontier, but that uh, if we draw on Penny Edmonds' work in this area, she's a historian of uh, colonial and humanitarian uh, Australia, she talks about um, shifting relationships that were happening in the developing township of Melbourne and makes a clear argument within her work that we should see settler urban spaces as frontiers, as they are sites of intimate, racialized and gendered relationships, their contact zone, and she describes this as just as much contact zone as far-flung squatting runs or farming ventures that we're more used to thinking about as sites of uh, frontier interaction. So the frontier then is not just out there, but it's here, it's in here in these urbanised spaces too. And that's what I want to try and think about today um, and draw on some documentation from a colonial official who worked with Indigenous peoples in the Melbourne area for uh, over 30 years and uh, think about from his documentation uh, what is going on in that early colonial period and how are Indigenous peoples and non-Indigenous peoples trying to manage uh, cross-cultural relations. So I'm drawing on then a set of colonial documents. These are the papers of William Thomas. Um, and that map that we just saw of Nam, Nurm is from this collection, from aspects of William Thomas's papers held in the Public Record Office of Victoria. The vast majority of his archive is housed in the Mitchell Library in Sydney. That's a collection of 23 volumes of papers written by William Thomas over the course of his career, where he worked first as protector and then later as what was called guardian of Aborigines of the Port Phillip district and then the colony of Victoria. He began in 1838-9 and worked right through until the early 1860s. And really he worked up until his death in 1867. So his most important contribution then was to work as an assistant protector in the first Port Phillip protectorate of the late 1830s and 1840s. He was one of four men that took on the role of assistant protector to George Augustus Robinson, who was appointed as chief protector straight after he'd come to Victoria from Tasmania. And indeed he came for that, that position. So Thomas then came straight from 
uh, London to Port Phillip. He had no previous experience working with Indigenous communities, but he came to work within what he saw as a humanitarian project um, that was designed to protect Indigenous peoples, as the British government thought, from the dangers of colonisation. He worked predominantly with Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung nations of the Kulin Alliance in and around Melbourne and the Mornington Peninsula over this period in the early colonisation of their country. The archive is a very important record of Kulin life in this time. So the information that I'm going to be talking about with you today is evidence coming from colonial historical documents. Aboriginal families have their own knowledge of these histories through their families, and they continue to hold their own specific knowledges of this. But today, the evidence that I'll show you is coming from the documents left by one non-Indigenous observer. As said, Aboriginal communities in the beginning days of Melbourne. Um, so my interaction with this set of documents began when I finished my PhD. Um, I'd looked, amongst other things, at ideas about the protection as British uh, humanitarians and colonial Australian officials saw it, um, the protection of Indigenous people in Australia and New Zealand. And I was really fortunate to be awarded a fellowship at the State Library of New South Wales, which worked with Thomas's papers. So I was working as a historian looking at themes of encounters between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and how Kulin nations might have attempted to um, manage colonial authorities. And at that time, this was how we ac accessed documents in the archive. This is what they look like. They're pretty horrible to read um, and they often look like this PowerPoint image. Um, and then in the interim period, digitisation projects have made working with the original documents much easier in large parts. The archive now look like this as they've been digitised um, and they're available through the Mitchell Library's collection. More than this digitisation, though, later scholars and families are able to draw on the quite amazing transcription work done by Margarita Stevens, who dedicated years to the transcription of this journal um, and to the work um, and published this with the Victorian Aboriginal Corporation for Languages, which is the peak body for Aboriginal language revitalisation in Victoria. And Vackel's role in this demonstrates how Thomas's materials then are extremely important as a vital source of Kulin languages documentation. Uh, Auntie Lee Healy, amazing work for the, her Tongarong language, for instance, made great use of Thomas's work, for example. And there are other sources along these lines, such as uh, family census lists, um, family census lists, um, held at the Public Record Office of Victoria, which are really valuable to communities now. And over the last couple of years, I've had the privilege of working with Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation on some aspects of family history and uh, supporting their own ownership of their family histories. And this has involved, for me, returning to Thomas's documents as well. So we're now more likely to draw on things like census documents, discussion of family groupings, area of, areas of country that people might have been travelling through at different times, and they're all really valuable for families now. These sources record significant information about how Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung peoples and other Kulin nations peoples lived in the early period of white colonisation. And we'll talk about the, the role of Aboriginal voices in this documentation a little bit later. The documents, though, are also a source of frustration and disappointment. Um, as... Protector Thomas, is he's not particularly interested in cultural information. He, he captures information that he deemed important rather than that which might be desired by families now. So he makes choices about 
what to document that often might make elders and families quite sad. For instance, one of the things that he tends to do is to document uh, when he's speaking about women with their husbands, he'll document only the names of the husbands rather than the names of the husbands and the wives. And then he'll write, uh, well, in this thing we see, he's writing and Lubra, for instance. And that means the man's name and his and his husband uh, and his wife. And this means that we miss out on understanding how families are organised together. We have some places where census lists will include everybody's name, but other places we don't understand uh, people together. The other thing that he doesn't really do very much is document the names of children, which is really, really um, difficult as well. And so that can be... Uh, involve additional work to try and understand uh, the names of everyone within a family grouping to provide uh, key details of Wurundjeri women's names and other Kulin nations women's names which is really difficult for families to have to do that additional work to get underneath and that's because of Thomas's ideas about who is important to document and they're very different to families ideas about who it would be uh, important to document so it speaks to a broader issue whereby Thomas documents what he thinks is important rather than providing Indigenous perspectives and I'll just give you a little sense of how this works for instance it doesn't fit within Kulin Nation's views of the role of women and the role of relationships and kinship as binding people together. It's summed up for me in an example that I was struck with really early on in looking at these documents is about the way that I came to understand William Thomas's wife's name. So Thomas only describes her as his wife or calls her Mrs T. So she's always connected to him in his writing. But on the 6th of November, 1839, Billa Bilari, the most senior Wurundjeri Wurrung clan head at the time and a key informant for William Thomas, Billa Bilari's wife had a baby. And in his journal, Thomas writes, an infant Susanna was born. And the next day, when he visited Billa Bilari's wife, she said to him, named after your Lubra, Susanna. And it's the first time I knew his wife's name was when Billa Bilari and his wife chose to call their child after William Thomas's wife. And so this is one of many examples in these documents where cool and people attempt to bring non-Indigenous people into relationship with them. Another lovely description of this is a couple of days earlier where cool and women refused to make baskets for William Thomas to sell. And he was trying to sell, uh, have them make small scale manufactures and, and uh, sell baskets. But instead, they made baskets for his children to have. He wrote, to my great surprise, just before sunset, two baskets were made by the Lubras for my eldest two girls. I told them I would give rice for them and send them to Melbourne to sell. But they said, we'll make them plenty by and by. You're for Melbourne, your picking is them. I obeyed their orders and I gave them from my own store flour and sugar. So Thomas is trying to get people to make manufactures of their own goods, baskets and, um, and other goods and send them to Melbourne to sell to offset the cost of the protectorate. And the cool and women are going, no, no, they're for your children. Yeah. This is about our relationship with you and your children rather than about necessarily selling. So we have these quite beautiful descriptions then of cultural life coming through not necessarily as Thomas documents it for um, 
this is what culture is, but we see it in the interactions between people and the way that people relate to each other. We have quite beautiful documentation of Kulin nations living in and around Nam, now Melbourne, and the way that people cared for country. For instance, we have some lovely uh, little diagrams that this one perhaps doesn't seem like a great deal, but the thing that it does is it documents spatial arrangements where people, the list down on this very blurry left-hand side, are numbered as camping in the direction of their country, so facing their country, and the tent at the top, the little triangle that's not coloured in with a little stick figure inside is William Thomas's camp. And then all people of different groups of uh, Victorian Aboriginal people, different Kulin Nations people, and perhaps people from further afield are camped facing the direction of their country. And this is one of the ways that people are making real their connection to country and their relationship to other people is through their movement through these areas. People are traveling over country as a way of affirming their relationship to it. And there's lots of documentation of this within the, uh, the Thomas archive. So for instance, we have practices that are for food gathering, sustaining people's lives throughout the year. One of those really important ones that he writes about is the gathering of eels in the Bowen Swamp and other lakes, the areas now, Doncaster, Bulleen, those sorts of areas. Thomas traveling with people, he notes, they always remained here on account of the great quantity of eels in the Great Swamp Bowen and others in the neighbourhood. He lived with the people while they supplied themselves amply for uh, a month or five weeks. And he come, we'll come back to talk about that in just a second. The journals in particular are full of sketches of things like their sketches of eel gathering, their sketches of these spatial arrangements. There are also a number of beautifully drawn portraits of Wurundjeri family members, some of them very finely drawn and polished to send to other colonists. Um, I'm not going to show you those images today without specific um, permission from families, but I know that some of those are included in the exhibitions at, um, at the uh, Old Treasury Museum, which has been developed with Wurundjeri, uh, the Wurundjeri Corporation. And there's many sketches like this one, which are more quickly drawn, but they're extremely important nonetheless. And one of the ones that I particularly love is uh, shown in a screen clipping here, shows what might be men with spears or potentially women with digging sticks loaded onto Thomas's car, traveling through country. And I think that this is documentation of people traveling through Bunurong country. Um, and as he's moving around an area where he took up land, which was Arthur's seat, so it allows practices to hunt for food, traveling through country, regeneration of country through burning. There's uh, Thomas tells that Wurrung and Boomerang people have told him how they have always done it. But turn out opossums and wombats, etc. He travels with people as they set fire to the landscape. They gather food and replenish country that way. And if we return to these issues of gendered knowledges and spaces, he also documents the way that men and women had separate spheres of influence that undertook different activities, both cultural and ceremonial. So in February 1840, for instance, he reports the movement of all people in different groups based on gender. The men leave for an initiation ceremony and he stays with the women who within a few days tell him we're going on to other places to get more eels and possums. They get kangaroos as well, he describes with abundance. And then people, the women in camp, they have a corroboree at night, he writes, and the men, while the men are away for the purposes of holding an initiation for young men, the women are travelling together. They're finding abundant food and they're hosting their own ceremonies. 
So Thomas then describes how every part of the city that we live in is Aboriginal land and he documents area, particular areas of land that belong to different people. But he also talks about how the Five Nations of the Kulin Alliance traditionally would meet in Melbourne for large ceremonial and political gatherings. It's a central spot to meet for large gatherings of many hundreds of people. And these continued well into the early colonial uh, settlement of Melbourne and they were only stopped through the colonial use of force. And this is something that I'm going to discuss at the end, is some of the colonial attempts to break up Melbourne as an Aboriginal political site. So Thomas records on many occasions the way that clan heads would meet and debate, their processes of collective decision making which characterise cool and political life. Typical is a comment in a letter to Robinson about the shifting of camps. So this is to George Augustus Robinson. A council took place in a, of 35, he writes, the greatest number he had known in council to that time of the principal men of each tribe. It lasted for near two hours. I soon learnt that their object was to record, withdraw altogether. So he's documenting these processes where people come together and they talk to make decisions about what would happen next, from things like moving around country to whether law or ceremony needed to be held. All sorts of decisions are being made in uh, through these collaborative decision-making processes. Um, and his first experience of this was in 1840 when... 500 people met from the five, uh, five Nations of the Kulin Alliance. More and more people came into Melbourne and Thomas um, began to fear that this was going to lead to, as he called it, a dreadful fray. But over the subsequent days, it became really obvious that this is not a correct assumption. And he started to glean really important information about ceremonial and political gatherings, how they were very organised, ritualised, largely non-violent. The settling of disputes between peoples was really carefully controlled and they were really important for managing the relationships between people. He tried to stop legal proceedings to begin with he decided to walk into the midst of spears being thrown and he recorded how the people he called his own blacks, by which he means Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boomerang people, intervened with members of the Kulin nations from further afield when he tried to stop proceedings of law. He said they went forward with their spears and they entreated the other people not to fight but to wawa or talk. The purpose of this was that if I was killed, soldiers would be sent to all parts of Blackfellas country that were there then and all the Blackfellas would be killed. So he's walking into the middle of legal relationships and the settling of disputes and people from Wurundjeri and Bunurong communities are going please don't kill him please don't kill him look what's going to happen even though he's done something that is terrible he shouldn't be interfering in law but they're like if you kill him this will go very bad for this for us later in that year these fears would be realized when Aboriginal communities were subjected to physical violence that was inflicted on them by colonial authorities. So there were gatherings of up to 800 people, these political gatherings that took place, really many of them in the early period of his work in, in places in central Melbourne, near the Botanic Gardens, the MCG, the South Bank of the Yarra, on the Merry Creek. And as time went on, it became a key part of his job to stop these gatherings. Yeah, describes all of these political processes. He describes the gatherings of large groups of people. It was the same system that he's describing was the one that had been utilized within the negotiation of the 1835 treaties in the area now Geelong and Melbourne 
when Kulin Nation's people had interacted with John Batman and the men of the Port Phillip Association. Batman had come with his ideas about having a treaty shaped by the Port Phillip Association's hope that their so-called illegal settlement in the eyes of the British government would be recognised and they hoped that they would be seen, it would be seen as a humanitarian settlement, a good thing to do, to negotiate with Aboriginal people. They were hoping that if they negotiated, there wouldn't be the same sort of fighting that had come to characterise Tasmania, the terrible warfare that they had come from. They entered into a space where Kulin Nation's owners of these countries had Tandarum, yeah? The formal ceremony of welcome whereby people from elsewhere still and may still be welcomed country. A Kulin Nation's protocol described as follows, where I'm quoting from the Wurundjeri Warrior on Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation website, Tandarum allowed neighbouring tribes temporary access to our resources and safe passage on our homelands. We should note here that it's the word is temporary, but the corporation describes how there are processes for granting access to resources, for ensuring safety for and respect for peoples and symbolic cleansing with scope. Smoke, it's a ceremony of respect and hospitality, of opening proceedings for what might be business to come. And as the University of Melbourne's description of the treaty to accompany the campus walk that is named after Bill Abilary says, um, and this is, a material, this is material that's also been um, guided by Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Elder Ani Margaret Gardner, they describe it as Europeans arriving on the banks of the Birrarong and how Billabalari and other clan heads had signed the Batman Treaty, allowing in good faith, as they say, the new arrivals access to their land and its resources. And they were employing a sophisticated method of conciliation to protect their people, their role as custodians of the land and their place, but it was to no avail. The treaty was not recognised. The welcome was temporary, but the people who came after it stayed. And we, we also still stay here now. I'm a descendant of those generations of non-Indigenous people who have come and who have stayed. In a couple of years, other people were coming. Soon there was a developing town with the governor, Charles, Charles Joseph Latrobe. So when William Thomas got here in 1838, there were approximately a thousand settlers in the township. And by the end of 1839, this had reached the number of 4,000. And it was in these circumstances then a very rapidly evolving uh, change within a colonial town, a place that had been a small settlement becoming a township that Thomas then arrived and he was armed to he was armed with instructions to protect Aboriginal people. And um, he was seen to, in this idea of protection by many settler interests within the developing colonial town to be threatening uh, colonial interests because he was, his job was to try and create a space for Aboriginal people within that colonial township. And this was seen as a threat to settler interests. It was his job though, to try and manage the relationships between different groups of people. The first thing he was instructed to do by La Trobe was to try and break up Aboriginal movement to make the two communities, uh, Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung nations live together on the same areas of country. He tried to make people live in one place on a permanent station. Um, this also was facilitated by the fact that Boonwurrung, Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung specific areas were being taken away from them. So for instance, when we were talking before about the areas around the Bolan swamps, 
These had been really, really important food sites, as he said. And then fences are put up. Aboriginal people were not allowed in. And areas of very, very important economic um, benefit were being shut off to people. The government then started also to restrict uh, the ways that Aboriginal people were, for instance, allowed to be paid. So Aboriginal people, until um, the protectorate started, were had been allowed to be paid within uh, but with guns, and the guns began to be confiscated by government. This was really, really important for people because the main use of the guns was accessing traditional food sources, which had become far more... Um, scarce with the arrival of Europeans. When people came to Melbourne, either because it was their own country or um, for the interests of pleasure or finding out what was going on in the colony, uh, they began to be driven out. These sorts of things, along with the continuing influence of disease, which pre had predated Thomas but continued on, meant that people were being increasingly taken away from their country or not able to access their country in the same way. And the people who Thomas came to work with appeared to view this change as a worse system than that that they had had straight after the treaty. Coolins Nation's people were under no illusion that the new government the governor, the protectors were trying to change how they lived and how they experienced their country. And Thomas records their, their voices directly in his documents. He has many instances of short quotes from Aboriginal people in a mixture of Kulin Nations languages and English. For instance, he records the words of Billabalari, who said, poor Billabalari said, he wrote, very bad, that no good governor. Very good, Mr. Faulkner and Batman. So he's harking back to the original relationship based on treaty, those negotiations that had happened in 1935. And he's like, this is a real problem now. Yeah. And it seems that the people were right, that the system came to be no good for them. There's one particular event which really marks an important moment in dispossession of Aboriginal people. And that's the Letsam incident of October 1840. So throughout 1840, as I've said, Aboriginal people began to be moved out of Melbourne. Uh, to begin with, this was Thomas's job. He needed to convince them to go. The Latrobe made Thomas choose what was considered an appropriate site for a permanent station as he called it, for Boomerang and Woiwurrung Wurundjeri communities. He worked to negotiate between the two groups and the decision was eventually made to choose the place known as Nari Nari Warren. The people though, so the understanding from Latrobe as well as from Thomas was that this was going to be permanent. People would move there and they would stay there and they would not then travel around their country. And this was something that he had not checked with anyone and just assumed that this would be the way that it was work. And people weren't going to give up their lifestyles of moving through their country and gathering in Melbourne for the business of the Coolan Alliance. They gathered again in Melbourne in September 1840. But by this time, Latrobe had decided he was going to do something about this. As Aboriginal people came to Melbourne, let some of the New South Major let some of the New South Wales military arrived in Melbourne. He had been sent there by New South Wales Governor Gibbs to investigate reports of Aboriginal attacks against a colonist's property on the Ovens River, 250 kilometres north, yeah, northeast, in the region that now includes Benalla and Beechworth. The people had guns, and Gibbs noted that they used them with considerable dexterity. 
they attacked the station while the owner was away. So Lanson was sent to do more than investigate. He was told that he could take hostages and he could take those hostages whether they had been part of the attacking party or not. And this is really key to what later happens. Uh, the instructions to Letson read as follows. You may detain hostages for the good conduct of any tribe, a reasonable number of any of individuals belonging to it, if the perpetrators of any act, sorry, if the actual perpetrators of any outrage can't be apprehended. In the selection of hostages, it will be proper for you to endeavour to secure the prisoners of some of the chiefs of the tribe or the sons of the chiefs. So when he got to the Ovens River, Letson couldn't find many Aboriginal people. Most of them were in Melbourne for a large gathering of the Kulin Alliance. So Letson followed them. But there he instructed William Thomas to give up Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people, but the protector refused. Letson then complained to Latrobe of being obstructed or at any rate, not being aided by Thomas. And on eight, the 1st of October, 1840, he launched the first raid on the Aboriginal camp in Melbourne. This was an action that Thomas strongly argued against, both at the time and in his later reports. Letsom and 11 mounted police rode through the Aboriginal encampment and Thomas asked um, if there was any particular charge against any of his Aboriginal people. He didn't get an answer and he felt indignant. He stated, oh, that a British parliament could behold the sight. My blacks were a peaceable tri tribe. Aboriginal people were camped on the opposite side of the Yarra to Thomas. Some left protector to cross the river and run through the camp with his mounted police. But at that stage, the people had had, had a chance to escape. Governor Latrobe sent Thomas to Gippsland a week later to investigate another attack on a station. So Thomas was absent when Governor Latrobe authorised the second Letsom raid on Coolin people in Melbourne. Latrobe told Letsom that a large group of Aboriginal people were in the township, people from all of the Coolin nations. He authorised Letsom to employ the means at your disposal to secure the end at once, but he warned Letson to avoid shedding blood as he described it. So that, that instruction then that earlier that hostages could be taken allowed the Major on the 11th of October to surround the entire camp of Aboriginal people on the Heidelberg Road. He marched nearly 400 people, it's been um, estimated, men, women and children through Melbourne to lodge them at the police barracks. Thomas was away when Robinson, George Augustus Robinson arrived, he found the group being held. 35 men and boys were changed two by two and separated from the rest. And the chief protector then reported the account of a colonist who said he witnessed the bringing in of the natives. He was shocked by the cruelty of the military and police. If the women, many of them had young children, happened to be behind and also the old and infirm, they were goaded with bayonets by the soldiers and hit with the butt end of their muskets or cut with their sabre. So that's the description that was given to George Augustus Robinson about what this march through Melbourne looked like. Two men were killed. One was Windbury, a noted Wurundjeri Woiwurrung warrior, and he was killed in the initial attack when he raised his waddy against an officer. He was shot. Another young man, Nuruknuluk, was shot when he tried to escape from custody. 33 men were held until mid-November in 1840. Ten were charged and tried. The others released. There was no charge against them. The men were not represented by counsel because Thomas was not permitted to interpret for them in court because he was said to have had too close a relationship with them as protector of Aborigines. Nine of the 10 men were sentenced to 10 years transportation. All but one escaped from the ship which carried them from their country. And Thomas was so critical of this attack. 
He harked back again to the original relations of the treaty. He said the Port Phillip tribes had more than once stood in the gap between whites and neighbouring tribes, and that's true. There were instances in the first years of the settlement of the area around Melbourne where Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung people had been uh, can, had had basically alerted people to attacks that might have been going to happen from people. Um, and there's snippets of Indigenous response in Thomas's journal that show that this was also the point that um, people were making uh, uh, to Thomas. So Aboriginal people were making these same points to Thomas about the attack. They asked, why white men, big one, frighten blackfellas? And Thomas said the attacks on the ovens had involved blackfellas killing white men and that Gibbs had sent the military in response. And um, Aboriginal people then from here said, well, that's plenty Bungalali, which means stupid. Big one wild soldiers, no Port Phillip blackfellas kill white men. Yeah. So like Thomas, Aboriginal people insisted that they had behaved peaceably towards colonists on their country. They could not understand why they would be subjected to raids by the military. Governor Latrobe saw this as a reason to um, blame the protectorate, that the protectorate had failed. He suggested the need after this for more mounted police. He said that I have looked in vain, so he wrote to Gibbs, I have looked in vain to the Chief Protector's Department for assistance in establishing secure and friendly relations with the Aborigines near at hand or at a distance, which can alone render the employment of coercive measures and the maintenance of a large police force unnecessary. So he put this down to the failure of the protectorate to be able to find peaceful ways to stop um, Indigenous people from protecting their country um, and resisting the settlement of their country. The attack didn't stop Aboriginal people from coming to Melbourne altogether, but it did scare, it seems to have scared people. It's made them, I think, really realise that the government was very serious about the way that it could use violence to stop them visiting places, to stop them being on their country in ways that had been central to their lives only a few years before. And they realised it was a deliberate ploy against them. It was a deliberate use of the military against them. It was a really large scale military action and the government had allowed it. In fact, they'd encouraged it to happen. So I think it's an important moment in the dispossession of Indigenous people from Melbourne. It's a signal that cultural gathering and movement through country in Melbourne was not going to be allowed to continue. There wouldn't be that same sense perhaps that there had been earlier, that peoples would be living together, yeah? The colonial government, through the use of the Let's and Raise, had decided that it would not allow these large gatherings, visible indigeneity, visible Aboriginal gathering within this colonial site. And I think it, it signals that Melbourne has moved at that moment perhaps from being a, a shared space towards one that was more where that frontier moment was coming to an end and Indigenous people would be very deliberately by the colonial government removed from Melbourne as an Aboriginal space. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you very much for that, Rachel. That was very enjoyable and um, on behalf of the old treasury and everyone in the audience today, I'd like to give you a big thank you for today's talk. No problem. So before we jump to the q and I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoyed today's talk and after this lockdown, in at the old treasury building, our exhibition 
uh, Yarra Stories of Melbourne's River, uh, features originals of Summer Thomas's materials. Um, on loan from the State Library, uh, and Rachel alluded to this, such as Thomas's portrait of the Rundry Narangeta or clan head Billabalari and uh, Winbury, and as well as a, um, as a map, a map drawn by Billabalari of the Yarra River that was in Thomas's papers, um, which is a really nice piece. And Thomas has sort of annotated what's what, um, the tributaries and stuff. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone uh, we have another public lecture next month on Sunday, the 15th of August at once again, 2 p.m. by Professor Barry Judd. And this will be on Aboriginal peoples and cricket in colonial Victoria. Um, the link uh, to sign up for that is available on our social medias and uh, the website. So we'll jump to the Q&A. Um, anyone's got any questions? Fire away and I'll read them out. So we've got one already. So this one, a little bit before Thomas's time, but still early frontier Melbourne. So they've yeah. asked, what impact did William Buckley have on understandings between European settlers and Indigenous peoples from the time of Melbourne's early settlement in 1835? It's a very good question. I, I think that I'm probably not completely qualified to answer it and probably Jackie's more qualified than me. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can think do it that knowing um, Jack's particular interest in William Buckley, one of the things that I think that's really interesting about Buckley is this idea that perhaps he comes to uh, in some ways stand in for other relationships, as in there's this very sense that, there's this very strong sense that Buckley is seen to have been Aboriginal <laughs> or with Aboriginal people and then is brought back within the, I suppose, mm. the so-called colonial fold. Um, and that he then is someone who is looked at to, um, to provide information and even if we think about Jack and I've sort of talked previously about his uh the book that's written with oh, by James him Morgan or, yeah you, interviewed he doesn't write it but he, he he's with interviewed him or yeah, for yeah. him or um so he, he he wanted to make some money in and um this this journalist in Tasmania um James Morgan wanted to write the Australian Robinson Crusoe so interviewed Buckley for this book so it's very hard to know when Buckley starts and Morgan because he twists it and makes it yeah and how Aboriginal people do so it's a, it's a funny source but it does have some like it does tell us much about you know pre pre-invasion um cool in society yeah 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 so he's a re he's a really important figure, but he's also a sort of marginal figure as well. I think in that he he comes to almost be like mythical for the relationship yeah. that he's had with with um, with cool and peoples, and then brought into um, the fold brought, again. Brought into the fold, yeah. Yeah, because he he was he's well. Fun fact: he's Victoria's first public servant. He was the um and used as the translator for the Coolan and um uh, between settlers. But he he doesn't stay very long in early Melbourne. He leaves in late eighteen thirty seven because he he's not trusted by both sides of the frontier. Europeans yeah. don't trust him. They think they'll be, they'll tell the Kulin, he'll tell the Kulin to, to, you know, rise up and get rid of them. Um, and the Kulin sort of don't trust him now that he's sort of entered this, the, the colonial fold again. So he seems to be very depressed in his later days in Melbourne. And then he leaves to go live in Tasmania. Um, yeah, all right. So yeah, he's having yeah. this experience where yeah. both sides think that he should be like, <laughs> different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. But he went around translating for people and, and was the intermediary for many years and um, and helped people like John Batman and Faulkner and stuff mm. acquire cool and material like possum skins and lyrebird feathers and stuff. So, yeah. Um, all right, we'll move on to the next question. So we've got, um, here we go. So someone's asking, do you think it is time for a reassessment of Latrobe as Lieutenant Governor? He is often presented as an educated, cultured leader, but can this view stand in the light of his treatment of the cool one? Well, that is a good one. That's a really good question. I think one of the, they're very good questions. This is, um, one of the things that I, I 
because I have tended to look at these documents for perhaps the other side, I've not necessarily got a huge handle on the historiography of Governor Latrobe. But one of the things that I would say is that within all of these early colonial governors and colonial officials, when we think about their role, they're working within a system of colonisation that has ways of dealing with Indigenous people. So when I talk about him as, you know, encouraging hostage taking, that's really not unusual. Like that is something that happens all over the place from, you know, even just in the Australian examples, um, it happens in Sydney. Arthur Phillip does it multiple times. It happens in the first contacts with Māori in New Zealand. They are taken as hostages and brought to Australia. I've just been writing something else with a, um, a Tongan colleague about the first uh, travels of Tongan people to Sydney. They were taken as hostages as well. So one of the things I think we can get caught up in when we look at these early colonial figures, either Indigenous people or colonists, is in this sense of, oh, are they, is every, particularly colonial figures, are they good? Yeah. <laughs> and in some ways it's beside the point that they are doing their job as colonial officials. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in in the depiction of William Thomas is often like, oh, he was a friend of Aboriginal people or he wasn't, he was, you know, he failed or he didn't. Well, no, he attempted to do his job using a whole heap of strategies that were quite normal in the relationship between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people that had been going on around the world. And for, for Latrobe, one of those things is hostage taking and the use of the military against Indigenous people. It's, it's quite a normal thing to do. And so I think if we, if we get too caught up in someone's personality traits, oh, yeah, he was a lovely guy, <laughs> you know, or, or he did some really good things, we actually can, it can then be really hard to think about, yeah, but what was his role? Yeah. And his role was to secure the colony here. And that is both physically, as in from attack, or culturally, as in this is a colonial space. And yeah. those things involve strategies like hostage taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah. maybe in that light, if people know the history is better than me, maybe it is time to reassess him if we're looking at him in really positive ways and not thinking about the whole of his role. Yeah, I think Latrobe's, there's a book, I think, yeah, let's hear. So there's this book, I'm going to this one, um, that was published a couple of years ago on Latrobe. And it has a chapter about his, you know, interactions with Aboriginal people and his policies. But there's nothing about the Let's and Raid. There's nothing about these things. So a lot of these things are forgotten. He's, he's often quite violent. Um, so I would say, agreeing with you, Rachel, yeah, I think maybe someone needs to reassess Latrobe a little bit more um, in his relation to Aboriginal people. Like he can, yeah, still held up as he being sort of a founding person of Melbourne. Um, and another, I think there's a, yeah, there's a yeah, desire yeah. to do that in general yeah, from non-Indigenous yeah, yeah. people. Like we, no one yeah. wants to think, oh, it's all terrible. Like it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah, part yeah, of yeah, a yeah, psych yeah. psychological feeling about, you know, not and, being awful if that's what you mean. Yeah, and, yeah, and, not, and, not and he led to a, yeah. A lot of Melbourne's infrastructure, the parks, the yes. hospitals, the, the founding yeah. of the universities, you know, up, you know, yeah. he contributed to that. And, yeah. The next question, I've got one more, unless anyone else wants to type anymore, is what are the ideal books to read about this time period, i.e. frontier wars and these early European and Indigenous interactions? Um, we'll list a few, but I'm happy to type a few into the chat as well, um, some titles as well. But, yeah, go, go yeah. far away, Rachel. Oh, one of the things I would say that can be really helpful as well is to try, sometimes it's not even... It, books is to try and look for Indigenous perspectives on, uh, on 
like remembrance of violence and things like this that would help to perhaps counter some of the ideas that Jack was just saying when, you know, sometimes violent histories aren't remembered or things like that is to say, well, there are people who remember and the people who remember are the, are the families. Yeah. yeah. And so there's, there's lots of websites um, and things like that, that people, that families contribute to where there is a perspective coming through that can help um, can help to counter some of these other histories that might be more, I don't know, a bit too gentle or more like, you know, celebratory, is to read material that's coming from the perspective of Indigenous families who are remembering the, the, their families' experiences. Um, so I think that, yeah, I think that there's there's scope for going into broader sources. Um, one of the other resources that's really valuable to look at and really very disturbing is the um, Newcastle University Colonial Massacre map. Um, yeah. And that, if you just Google the Newcastle Univ University of Newcastle Colonial Massacre map, you can see the way that frontier violence moved across Australia and you just watch these there's a sort of timeline of the of the um of the violence and this raid wouldn't be included on it because it's not it's not a massacre it's a different mm. type of relationship one characterized by violence nonetheless but it's not a massacre and you can see the ways that and the the ways that frontier violence moved with colonial dispossession of Indigenous people or at least attempted dispossession of Indigenous people. Um, and you'll see, for instance, um, around the few years later than the time we're talking about here, the terrible violence in Western uh, Victoria, the Western districts of Victoria being thought of as the, one of the two most violent areas in the colony of New South Wales at that time. Um, yeah, yeah, so so this, Victoria is a site as well as these sort of um, aspects that would not be thought of as massacre. Victoria has uh, some really, really difficult histories of, of massacre and the work of um, Professor Lyndall Ryan at the University of Newcastle in relation to reassessing uh, massacre is really quite valuable. Like what, what sources there are, how do people remember violence um, and how should it be characterised? And some of that around this uh, Australian Research Council funded project to measure uh, and document um, frontier conflict. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. We've got another. We'll have we've got a few more. Um, what about the journalist? I can see one. About yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you can read that. You want to answer that? Yeah. 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 Okay. So looking at Edmund Finn, an early Melbourne journalist, Thomas took Finn to an Aboriginal funeral around Yan Yin, a fact finding trip for Finn. Liz, can I ask what year is it in? Oh, that probably doesn't help because you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I'm used to teaching where people can just. Because uh, one of the things I think that you could would be interested in looking at that is the role of different people in perhaps negotiating or allowing uh, Thomas to bring somebody else. So whether that was Thomas's decision alone to say, okay, Edmund Finn, let's come out and have a look at a funeral. And particularly early on, he seems to be, uh, he's very interested in ideas around things like funerals, around things like, um, healthcare, uh, people, different people identified as doctors, uh, the way that people uh, look after um, people who are sick or what might happen to people when they die. Um, but 
it would be really interesting and I wonder whether uh, Margarita's work with the document with the journals whether you could see when Finn goes who speaks to him does he actually get to see anything or is it private to what extent is uh, Thomas allowed to take him to that funeral or is it sort of uh, as a difficult experience um, and so you'll actually see um, you might be able to read a sort of broader experience of what's going on and whether people are trying to um, provide information through Thomas that Finn might be able to document within the newspaper or whether Thomas is trying to say oh let's describe it like this or this is really interesting you should come and see how this works so I think that there's sort of because of the nature of relationships that are at the heart of the protectorate there's different things that might be going on that lay underneath Finn's visit but certainly he was Thomas spent a lot of time sort of I don't know acting as an ethnographer or an informant around Aboriginal culture to different people like Latrobe like later um Brow Smythe um he made a big contribution to Brow Smythe's uh, Aborigines of Victoria that massive two volume work so he he looks like he was at some stages thinking of writing a book. So there's this sort of ongoing information sharing that he's involved in. And probably each example of that would need to be checked to see, you know, how much interaction is there with Indigenous people through that. Um, and there might well be that he Finn is allowed to be there or it might be that Thomas has sort of snuck him in a bit um and and trying to get information out that way yeah 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 yeah. yeah. all right okay. we'll move on to another that person who said that um you can feel free to contact Jack and then maybe get in and Jack will give you my or the treasury and they will give yeah, you yeah. my email address and um yeah and we can have a chat about it trying yeah. to access the actual documents and then there's yep. another one, um, more of a statement. Um, I'm not sure what they mean with this. A more significant period was post self government and land boom. I think that's in frontier relations. So I may be so alluding to yeah, Corinbeck yep. and stuff. Oh yes, um, yes, yeah, yes. Which is that's wasn't covered very, in this very talk, true. Yes, but, very, very true. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Yeah, Corinderk in particular is a vitally important time. I wouldn't say more significant, but. Um, vitally important time for thinking about um, the maintenance of Victorian Aboriginal culture in the face of uh, the experience after um, people have been um, largely moved out of Melbourne. Yeah. 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 And we note the way that Wurundjeri and other Kulin Nations elders and uh, politicians continued to come back to Melbourne to interact with colonial government and fight uh, for their, the recognition of their rights. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've got another one. Um, uh, talking about the Mount Cottrell massacre, which is in um, sort of uh, north of Werribee area, west in the western suburbs of Melbourne, asking, are families aware of others close to Melbourne that are unlisted on the massacre map? Oh, I don't know. It's actually not. It's not something that I have discussed uh, with families. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I know there are, especially in the Western District, ones that aren't included because it's only in oral histories. Yeah. And yeah. so, due to the problems of the 1990s and the history wars. Um, to classify a massacre, it has to have a number of different sources and they put a lot of emphasis on written sources, mm, which exactly. aren't really documented. And a lot of people are not documenting like massacres, Europeans writing it down, I've found. So yeah, yeah. there are definitely and, and ones out yeah. there that aren't documented. Yeah, and one of the things that Lyndall Ryan's work is really interesting on is, and I can give Jack and um, Katie the, the link to a particular article, um, is around the question of in what circumstances do people document things that are uh, 
both, uh, of course, for the victims, but also for the perpetrators, deeply traumatising. Um, and so there's been work thinking about the nature of documentation and just how hard it is to have documentation of things that people would really much rather forget. Mm. And so there's, there's actual, there's sort of work from psychology as a discipline that helps us to understand the nature of things like post-traumatic stress disorder and what we can, what humans can remember and what they write down and when they might do it. For instance, quite a number of sources might come from a much later date when people in their later lives are thinking through what, what they've done and then they might tell people later on. Yeah. Um, so there's, so there's a number of, like, the idea of, oh, it's got to be this many sources that sort of, that those ideas are designed to make sure that no one can say, well, it didn't happen, that actually places very, very strict European and Western historical boundaries around what can be considered sources. Yeah. yeah, but it's yeah. not something that's not something that I've ever discussed with people. Yeah. Um, we've got two more questions and these will be our final ones. Um, so we've got one. Um, do you have anything to say about the Aboriginal school on Mary Creek, its role, influence, et cetera? But they, as they allude to, it might be a whole <laughs> other topic. Um, it's a really... Uh, there's lots of really interesting things going on at the Aboriginal School at Merritt Creek. Um, it is a whole topic, but uh, I think those early school um, sort of experiments, as the protectors might think of them or as colonial officials might think of them, are very, very interesting sites of colonial and Indigenous interaction. The... Uh, in the Australian situation, the role of schooling and what and the perceptions that come around schooling uh, in these early protectorate um, uh, systems, both here and elsewhere, and when I'm thinking about the elsewhere, I'm thinking mostly of the um, of the uh, school in Sydney where Aboriginal children are brought into the Blacktown um, school. They tend to be, uh, there's a great deal of emphasis placed on them within colonial uh, discourses and sort of watching what's happening at that school. There's a lot of, um, forms of representation around racialized ideas about are people amenable to being educated? Are they um, able to be educated? And so there's they, they, those schools take on a great deal of importance within uh, government and humanitarian circles. How long will people leave their children there for? What will happen with, uh, you know, if there's uh, any different sort of incidents within the relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people? Will Indigenous people take their children away? And so some of those early schooling um, experiences then become sort of rife with characterizations about the role of Aboriginal parents that then lead to what we might think of as much harsher ideas about whether children should be removed from their parents more permanently. So schooling within colonial circumstances is extremely important as a sort of like colonial experiment or watching of children and parents as to how they feel about a Western education, what that education leads to for them. Will children behave from an education in a way that would make them more amenable to policies that we would later characterise as assimilation? Um, how do people, can people be educated to 
effectively what colonial officials want is give up Aboriginal cultures. And so that those schools become really, really important within that, the watching of school children. And then later on that sort of, okay, we have to take children away from their families. So I tend to think that schools play a really important part in the development of what become increasingly hard ideas about family life and what we see later on as developing into policies that would become the, the foundation for the stolen generations, um, all around children and, and who looks after them and how they behave. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, the last question. That was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the last question. Um, so uh, what have we got? Um, so they say the Learmonth brothers built a watchtower-type structure and fought um, in case of attack of at their station northwest of Ballarat called Eric Um Doom. Yeah, wow. in 1840s. I don't think they were ever attacked by Aboriginal peoples. Was this a common thing to do by the early squatters? We could, we could both handle this, but go for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, we've been talking about something similar at mm. your old school. Yeah. In Geelong. My, Is yeah. that right? <laughs> so, yeah, I went to school in Geelong, and um, in my school was in the suburb of Bell Post Hill, and it gets its name from a bell on the hill. <laughs> um, and that bell was in, in the grounds of my school and still there um, to this day. Um, and it was put up for frontier violence regions. It was put up to ring, to alert Geelong and the surrounding stations and stuff um, of the Wadarong people coming. So um, on the hill there, it was within the grounds of the old Morongo homestead by um, James Cowie, um, who I think his name's James, but Cowie, um, who was one of the first squatters in Geelong. Um, but yeah, it was it was used to, to ring and warn that um, Aboriginal people were approaching. Um, I have seen defensive architecture like that in Western Victoria. And, and if you go driving up at the Gol like the Goulburn area, I've seen like uh, buildings and barns and stuff with, with gun hole shoots. There was defensive architecture. And it, even in the Western District Native Police Barracks where they were using Aboriginal people as policemen, um, they're very fortified buildings and positions when they're yeah. engaging in frontier violence. But yeah, what, what, yeah, what else do you have to say, Rachel? Oh, I would say that it's a, it's a really interesting, I can answer it from much more abstract sort of way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Early colonial representations. So my PhD research was looking at ideas of the race uh, of racialization and how to sort of conduct co colonies in Australia and New Zealand and the different ways that Aboriginal people and Māori were understood by um, colonial officials and sort of British observers and one of the big things that was really interesting in the setup of uh Sydney Port Jackson was this idea that there wouldn't need to be defensive settlements. There wouldn't need to be the erection of defensive and fortress structures because Joseph Banks had decided after a couple of weeks going up the coast of New South Wales and not seeing very many Aboriginal people at all, but he decided that Aboriginal people wouldn't resist. And so by comparison to Māori, who were always believed to be warriors who would resist and where, who built fortifications within the landscape that were seen as being and were, but were more importantly, were seen as being about warfare and defensive uh, structures, there was a direct um, sort of oh, we will choose New South Wales because we won't need to build the same defensive structures. So then the fact that individual colonists are building these defensive structures is really quite interesting, instructive, not to mention like disturbing in that we see that the government has said within its own early sort of documentation, oh, we don't need to do that. And yet individual 
non-Indigenous people who are attempting to take up country from Aboriginal people are building fortifications that are about protecting themselves from Aboriginal people resisting their dispossession. So there's this sort of sense that early on in the colonisation of Australia, these things were thought to be, we don't need them. You know, Aboriginal people won't resist. Yeah. Yeah. And some of that is by comparison to Māori who were thought to be, oh, they will definitely resist, you know. So it's about, like, I suppose these racialized ideas about people who would be more passive and people who would be more aggressive and what do you do when you're trying to take over those different places. Um, and then that shapes all of these sort of colonial instructions or things like that. Yeah. Yep. Again, uh, a long yeah. answer. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. I've held you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then, <laughs> in that case, that's it. That's thank you so much again, Rachel. Thank you very much. And, um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, great everyone, questions. for attending. Yeah, yeah. Great questions. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And um, yeah. All right. Tune in next time. <laughs> All right. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.